Um, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here on this gorgeous fall day and to mark the opening of Leslie Thornton's exhibition with this presentation and conversation on her work. My name is Natalie Bell and I'm a curator here at the List Visual Arts Center at MIT. And I have the pleasure of having organized Leslie's exhibition, Begin Again Again, which opened to the public yesterday. And I'm joined today by Judith Berry, professor at ACT here at MIT. And of course, also with Leslie Thornton, who'll be presenting on uh, select works that are on view in the exhibition upstairs. Uh, in a career spanning over four decades, Leslie has often stretched the boundaries of film and video in iconoclastic works that exploit the faults and fissures that are inherent to time-based media and recording technologies. Her early encounters with experimental, structuralist, and cinema verite traditions as a student in the 1970s fueled her take on the moving image and gave shape to a practice of weaving together her own footage and voice with archival film and audio. In part, through a forceful and dynamic use of sound, she exposes the limits of language and vision in her works, while also acknowledging the ways that language and vision nevertheless are central to scientific discourse and narrative in general. With lush and unruly collages of both found and filmed footage, her works are experimental and essayistic. They revel in the saturation of images and information that technology has yielded. They probe the liminal space between thought and language, and they embody the fraught process of looking and learning. They also, importantly, underscore a concern about how technology has the capacity to exceed human control and understanding, which in her works is a thread that begins with looks at the development of the atomic bomb and continues into explorations of AI. Leslie's interest in the history of nuclear technology also has a personal resonance, as both her father and grandfather were involved in the Manhattan Project, and many of her works have taken a close look at the tangle of science and ethics inherent to that. Leslie has been hailed as a contemporary of visionary image makers like Chris Marker, Chantal Ackerman, Michael Snow, and Haroon Faroqi, and yet she has not had a significant solo presentation in the US. This will be her first. And, um, and I think one of the reasons for that is that her work really defies easy categorization. Uh, she's drawn on strategies of documentary filmmaking and experimental film, but also her works have actively refused narrative at times, often. Um, and as is evidenced in her years long, 30 year long cycle, Peggy and Fred in Hell, um, her works have often resisted closure. They've been ongoing. Uh, multi-chapter, multi-episode projects. So we'll hear more about that. Um, her exhibition here is her first major presentation at a US institution, the largest to date. It includes um, what I felt were her most important projects. And, um, and that begins with Peggy and Fred and Hell, a, a kind of surreal dystopian allegory. Um, it also includes works that excavate her family's relationship to World War II military technologies. Uh, and it opens connections between her earliest works in the 1970s, um, including one made while she was here at MIT as a visiting grad student, uh, and then also her most recent works. So um, thanks again for joining us. I encourage you all to spend time in the exhibition as well. Uh, it's a show that I think encourages repeat visits if you're able. And the work itself is work that both challenges looking, um, but rewards, rewards extended looking as well. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm happy to dive in and, um, and launch this, this presentation with a view of Extracts, which is Leslie's first work made in 1975 uh, with Desmond Horsfield. And it was a work that she actually submitted um, to the to the graduate student program here at MIT um, and was accepted with. So I'll, I'll leave her to speak about that and take it from there. Thank you. And on suit itself, as expressions of shadow white exchange, a sky broker works, I believe, the sky life 
terror, feet of the black crawl and the rock together. For over all the stars in the pool of walls, head sight, to her bright head that can swing the group. Singing, and on a pot on list, frozen with new up chicks, hand up among her lights, so lost in breasts, moon her moving battered by the edge of the cut, just up two rounds, the girl still round. Woman fought her work, those shrouds, and no withdrawal aid, she lived. I have one question, I'm sorry. Uh, is it possible when we look at the excerpts to dim the lights a little? We can do that, I think, moving forward. Yeah, that would yeah. be great, I think, for the audience. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> okay, that's good. Um, hello, everyone, thank you. <laughs> We're allowed to do this. <laughs> so I'll just keep talking the whole time. <laughs> uh, it, thank you so much, Natalie, for your kind words now and for your insights all along in uh, curating this show, which is a complicated show. And I'll say as an artist to face the, essentially the entire history of my work, uh, you learn a lot. Uh, and one of the things I learned is that there's a consistency. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Yeah, I said to uh, Natalie a few days ago, you know, I never did a Jasper Johns. Meaning, I, I didn't keep ma making an American flag and find this utterly fascinating as a painter to rediscover each time I paint an American flag more. Uh, I did the opposite, I thought. So, I did. It was always, where's an unknown? Where's, where's territory that I haven't felt seen uh, yet? And well, there's no answer. You kind of stumble into it. This first piece um, is uh, I made as a student, and it's uh, nine minutes, and it's structured um, around a score we made ahead of time, a grid-like uh, arrangement of uh, units of time, and also what the camera would be doing as we filmed. So <clears throat> when we actually set out to film, uh, we wanted to work with somebody else, not me, but he wasn't available that day, so we just uh, hung around the house. It didn't matter because all we wanted was to follow this structure that was predetermined. The uh, one association I had at that time was with some of the work done in experimental music um, w with people like, uh, let's say, Terry Riley, for instance, where there was a strong structural element that was set in place, and then the kind of uh, aesthetic content is uh, laid out uh, and has a kind of effect, but it's not, uh, I can't say any more about that, sorry. <laughs> I don't need to go there. So we thought of it as a really dispassionate piece. Um, and I had been painting before I made extracts and my co-author, Desmond Horsfield, was a sculptor. Uh, uh, I do want to say something about starting to work in film and not uh, letting painting go, because so I was very serious about painting, but I also had this feeling as a 21-year-old, the only way I can go and follow what I think is right in painting is to end up white, white room, nothing. And I did already know a lot about experimental film, starting at a, going, by going to a Unitarian church in Schenectady, New York on Sunday afternoons where <laughs> the minister uh, showed experimental film or Allen Ginsberg would show up. And so starting in high school, I was aware of um, this form. Uh, but when I went to grad school uh, for an MFA, met Desmond, we were both feeling constricted by 
are mediums, and I had the sense uh, if I turn my back and I engage in time, time-based medium, at that time film, the entire world opens up and the world will not end. So it will always be new. There will always be some place to move, which I still believe. Um, I had a hard time with postmodernism language when it was as if that's not possible. I didn't buy that. It's possible. So, uh, extracts. So it was like it freed you, actually. What, postmodernism? No, no. <laughs> the extracts, the, the filmmaking it was freed a start. you to really experiment. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, the film, the next film in the exhibition, which I was very glad Natalie chose to include, is called All Right, You Guys. And it was made in part, or pretty much finished up here in an extraordinary program uh, that existed for a while, uh, run by Richard Leacock and Ed Pincus, both major figures in uh, documentary. Uh, so, all right, you guys, was also a work that was set up ahead of time on paper with a sense of what the timing of shots would be, not the content, because we were shooting documentary footage of two different people. Our experiment in this case was, can we do a kind of abbreviated portrait of two people by placing them in the same film, asking them to do somewhat the same things, but in their own way, and filming what happened. So it's not scripted. Uh, what was scripted was the questions or situations we'd put them in, and then it's a, it it's became a six part, or always was going to be a six part, uh, strange uh, kind of gestural and oral portrait of two women who are very different. The differences come out because they're next to each other. Rather than a, a documentary about my sister or my friend who are in this piece. Uh, so we had a good time working here, a great time. Loved working with the other students, but we didn't fit in the idea of cinema verite very well, and we were asked to leave because we were too much artists. So <laughs> <laughs> that was a really great moment. I thought, I actually thought, that's your loss. I did think that. <laughs> like failure or for you, for all abandonment <laughs> can be really character building. Those moments are important. In defining Leslie, yourself. I think it's interesting, though, that you were accepted with extracts, right. which we just saw. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty experimental, too. Right. So you would think they knew what they were getting. Well, it ha I was also accepted into the grad program at NYU with extracts, and then I went to meet with them, and they said, it's great, but of course you can't do anything like that here. So, so, oh, well, thank you for letting me know. Bye. Yeah. So uh, that's the first two. Yeah. Do you so, want to say a little bit about, um, you know, what this tension was at the time and sp speculate on why you think that, why you think All Right, You Guys wasn't working for the documentary section here at MIT? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know the answer because we've talked about this, but um, uh, yeah, let's do a little more. I loved Leacock's work, and I didn't know Pincus's work so well, but um, and he's a character. If any of you ever and, met him, and then, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> what was inconceivable to them, I believe was uh, th there was this idea of authenticity at the time. And, uh, and I'm actually saying to them in class, well, what you're doing is constructing a narrative. You're shooting a bunch of footage, film footage, uh, let's say in a high school, about a high school. Um, but the structure of the piece, finally the film that you share, is structured as a story. 
um, they didn't like that comment because for them, for, for the sensibility of the place was that no, we are presenting um, a, real, a kind of reality, a pre, way pre-reality TV. So it's almost as real as, well, maybe, like reality TV. There was no real to it. So there was that, just a difference in attitude. But what they particularly despised <laughs> was that we set up the structure ahead of time that made no sense to them. Um, and the, the, fo the footage is truly, this is what's happened this day. Uh, and, and it's uh, very tightly edited. But ryth rhythmic patterns, um, they, uh, it was unbearable to them. Mm -hmm. Well, I think at that time, though, there was a real tension between experimental film, which was visual, and then cinema verite, which was the truth. I mean, even yeah, the idea. title. Yeah. And I, I think that tension was really palpable in those days, because you also had people like Gene Youngblood right. doing his thing, and then you know <laughs> all the other after that. And then, then video happened, which was also kind of shocking, because then you could be really in control. Right. Plus so, conceptual art, which was rule bound, which so everybody could like that. Even I, I find here at MIT, a lot of scientists like conceptual art because it, it shares rules and they have rules. So it's one, one way you can have a conversation. Yeah. But um, I think that's really interesting, that tension. Yeah, Lee Cock was generous in his dismissal because he was saying, you are artists, your interests have more to do with the artistic. You will do well, you will do fine, just not here. It doesn't fit. Um, but we had a great time with other students who would <laughs> sneak in to see what we were doing and then open the door to see if Ricky was out there or Ed before they'd step out, because we were actually pariahs. So I don't want to like, <laughs> don't, don't too much time to that. Um, and I love MIT, I will say that. And I was an <laughs> MIT groupie from the time I was 18. I just hung out here. Uh, yeah. So Should we jump now, from there and maybe yeah. talk about um, your, you know, your relationship to the sciences through your family? Oh, well, yeah. That would, that would be good. Yeah. So <laughs> um, the next short the expert will show is from a piece called Let Me Count the Ways, which has a series of uh, short passages. Um, and, and for the installation, instead of showing it as the 14, 15 minute long, uh, more linear piece, um, Natalie intervened in an interesting way and broke out the parts. So it's a whole ensemble in the first room uh, you'll go into. Um, so my dad and my grandfather both worked on the Manhattan Project. And uh, we all have histories, family histories. You can dig back. It can be very interesting. Um, this was especially poignant for us as children because I did grow up in the 50s and 60s, which is during the Cold War, and then uh, was in a family that was <laughs> secretly working on stuff related to the defense in the Cold War and, uh, and knowing some of that. So uh, there's some uh, vi visuals that come out of experiences of just visiting dad at work uh, when schools would have father-daughter day. And I grew up outside of Cincinnati in the countryside so my friends would go to see milk bottling or the farms, their fathers, no, were, no mothers were working, so they were fathers were farmers, but we'd go to this top secret uh, facility with the, like transformer robots out in the parking lot and then be dressed in white and Geiger countered and robotic arms handling a material uh, that was uh, radioactive. Um, and that's a lot to see as a kid. So it was, I never wanted to go to Disneyland because it was just so much more interesting to go to see dad's <laughs> work. 
And I figured they're letting me in because I'm five or six or seven years old, so what am I going to do about this? Uh, and I'll say something else about secrecy, which comes up uh, in very a number of ways secretly in my work and in one of the later pieces more overtly. If you uh, happen to grow up in a family where the family is involved in secrecy, language is strangled. And, and it, it's, it's, it, it, it exceeds the vocational situation or the business or the, uh, it, 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 I only have come to understand this more recently, but you can know, oh, my dad's very smart. You would not know from talking because uh, the habit of, of retaining what he's dealing with every day, all day, it carries over. So you only know he's a nice guy. He loves you um, and he takes a lot of pictures and he brings friends home from work and they push you on the swing set and that's about it. Uh, in the piece cut from Liquid to Snake, which is from 2019, you'll see my aunt. Uh, I filmed her a few years ago uh, for a project that did start with Norwegian Public Television about my family, my, my Norwegian family, my dad and grandpa, and then the rest of them, because uh, they're quite characterful um, uh, in the fact that my grandpa and dad both worked on the Manhattan Project and uh, somebody came across this in Norway in an interview and, and got in touch with me. So we worked together for about a year on that. And one of the things I did was film var various family members. And Aunt Nusa is one of them. It's really strange, you'll see. Uh, it's, all, it's only a minute long, but to see an 80-year-old woman sitting in the kitchen at a breakfast table, and I just stuck my camera on and she, you see, she knows all this stuff about <laughs> the atom bomb. And it was just true. They just, my like, dad's siblings, they just maintained this fascination all along. So it really, it was both growing up around, uh, you know, uh, all the men worked in science, uh, I mean, both grandfathers and my dad, and then all these relatives who were proud, actually. Of, of the work that was done uh, and fascinated and maintained that interest um, till their deaths. Uh, Should we watch the clip and so, you yeah, can continue? Yeah, so this footage we're going to look at now uh, is uh, the first passage in Let Me Count the Ways, which is, uh, I, I made this when my dad died. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. And then I did decide to go on. Uh, with this uh, a progression of short pieces that focused in different ways around the Hiroshima bomb. Um, so he gave me this footage, and you'll see it's simple. Let's run the second video, please. If we could dim the lights. That's okay for me. <laughs> that was good back there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. That's fine. It's only a minute. <laughs> で、レポートかね、生活、ま、設備に対して、ま、
まあ、まあ当時のね初回した、まあまあ、旅行とかね生活貯蓄に対してシェイクはどんな便利を与えてくれましたかパンしたようでございます自分などは近いですから自分に運べない
through the dispassion of being a medical person. It's partly that. But she says, you'll hear her say, yes, and then they turn green. And they're talking about, she's talking about people, and then they die. Mm -hmm. Or their finger, fingernails yeah. fall off. Um, or they were lying on the, on the ground and they didn't get burned. And yes, exactly. That was like the most amazing. There were many bizarre <laughs> yeah. things. And so she's an extraordinary, chilling, absolutely chilling commentator. And uh, so I probably will continue to explore that language, but you'll, you'll catch a bit of it here. I didn't translate the Japanese voice. She doesn't say many different things. It's more what I felt was right was for the exhaustion of her voice to be there. Mm -hmm. um, so that is part of the simplicity of the piece. And, uh, and then later we hear from uh, Madame Pashikov, this nurse, which you will hear. So that's, that's what happens in this episode. And then you'll see there are three more episodes or passages. Uh, on exhibition here that in different ways do orient around the, pre the moment, the before, the, act, the moment of the bomb, and the aftermath. And then the fifth uh, sequence that it exists now um, is a focus on Hitler, which was <laughs> really hard to make. It's only a minute long. I didn't want to include it, actually. but. But we, we did, and I'm glad. Uh, but it's very hard uh, to look at Hitler every day for a couple months when you're working on something. Uh, but I do, I frame him, and please do listen to the sound, by the way, those of you who get to spend some time here. The sound is always really critical in my work. It's, it's the engine of my work in almost every case, or maybe every case. The sound is the engine. The sound is where the magic, the manipulation, the message, the feeling, everything's in the sound. Might I ask a question about how you work on that? Do you start with the sound, or do you start with the image? It varies. And go back and forth? Or? It, it's, uh, there's no one way. Uh -huh. Yeah. OK. And sometimes it's also scripted. And mm -hmm. increasingly, in the last 10 years especially, I've used my own voice more and more performing scripts as a kind of persona. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the voice gets very distorted, so you, you would not recognize it. But um, it's true of the last episode that you'll see of Peggy and Fred in Hell, uh, just jumping to that for a moment, uh, which is called The Fold. And it's when, at the moment in this many year project, 30 year project, when I finally could close the project because the AI entity that I'd imagined was observing these two kids all along, uh, which was just me, <laughs> I, was, I, I used the notion of an AI from 1983 on as a, a backstory device for me to keep looking and spending time with these kids. And uh, so a bit related to surveillance, but data, it was accumulation of data about these kids in this post-apocalyptic world. We'll talk more about that. Um, what was I saying? Because I, I lost my thread right then. Um, it was, because we were still back on, oh, well, just Hitler. Just, let's yeah, just get Hitler. past Hitler. Does, yeah. All right, just listen to the sound. That's the sound <laughs> yeah. All right, so Should next. we dive into Peggy and Fred? We should dive into Peggy and Fred. I will just say, uh, this is a work that's, uh, I mean, people say is my master work. Well, anything you work on for 30 years is going <laughs> to get to be like that. <laughs> so uh, it it's was a, extraordinary. A 30 year project. <laughs> it, it, yeah, I've worked with these kids for filming them for eight years. And I will answer this question before you look because it is always like 99% of the time the first question after screening. What did you tell the kids to do? Should I answer that? I used to think it was hostile, that question. And then I came to hear it a different way. 
Um, so actually, I won't answer it right now. I just changed my <laughs> mind. Let's look, and then you'll see why people might ask that, and then I'll say a little more about that um, and more about the project. <laughs> OK, so let's run the third video. And that lighting was uh, fine, that last lighting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, it turned out coming to MIT and being around Leacock and it really helped. If, any, if I am adept at anything, it turns out to be live uh, cinematography or videography. I don't, I guess I was born this way, but it's like a magnet, it's like animal <laughs> magnetism that I can anticipate and also invoke things. So it's like magic. The kids, uh, were my neighbors, and they the day I met them, they wanted to record themselves uh, performing. I mean, I'm half moved in. I only have a couple suitcases in San Francisco. Moving into their house, they're my neighbors. <coughs> they saw my, excuse me, <coughs> I'm just gonna take a drink here. <coughs> they saw me uh, with my tape recorder. Um, and they were adorable, and they said, record us, record us, record us. So I just stopped moving. We sat on the front step, and they started telling me stories, and I'm recording. <laughs> and some of what they said that day is in the project, so that very first day. Um, and they were uh, imitating uh, actors and doing whole scenes from Freddy Krueger movies in particular. <laughs> also, The Shining, um, the boy uh, Donald uh, was very in love with Jack Nicholson. <laughs> he knew all of his films and he was six and she was eight. And she was uh, really into um, Michael Jackson. So she was always singing and kind of moonwalking and uh, I just, it was an imp impossibly extraordinary moment to meet these kids and that very evening to speak to their father 
about whether I might be able to work with them uh, doing some recordings, and they seemed very interested, the kids themselves. And he said, sure. And I explained I, was, I made films. So we were on. We were on as of the first day of meeting these two children. I had already planned on filming, making a more conventional film. Working with two adults, I'd filmed before. I, I made a kind of structuralist documentary about th this family, and the parents were named Peggy and Fred. <laughs> and I already had the title, Peggy and Fred in Hell. And it was going to be about uh, an idea of technology exceeding, uh, produced by mankind, humankind exceeding the scope of humankind, and as uh, represented by uh, a, a atomic bombs, nuclear bombs. Um, when I met the kids, everything changed that day. And Peggy and Fred are gone, those people, What's the technology, television, more generally, mainstream media? This is in 1983, and there's this sense of the millennium is impending. There are people who were called futurologists, and uh, the one name I remember was Faith Popcorn, was a, a well-known <laughs> uh, futurologist who would predict things about how life would be then, Right, in 2000, many of which, many of these things came true. One thing, insert, she said, was that people would nest. She, she expected, for various reasons, more and more people wouldn't go out in the world, like to watch movies, uh, visit each other at their houses, that they would create entertainment centers, for instance, at home. Uh, the TVs were better, the sound was getting good, and and she really was talking to a kind of dissolution of neighborhood and community towards home, nest, she called it. Well, that happened. Um, another phrase that was circulating that I really attached to was the information explosion. So, so there was a sense of there's going to be so much stuff that uh, this was pre-cable TV for instance, but let's just say in television that uh, it would splinter and there would be this abundance and there was some sense around uh, what might be happening with computers, but that overall a feeling that things are speeding up. And you probably remember this because I actually consider you a participant, <laughs> very much actually, uh, and an interest in the notions of excess. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, that was in, yeah. that's in your work. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, it. so within the arts, um, there were a few people uh, finding ways to address this related kind well, of apprehension was about that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. and so Judith would be one of those people. And uh, so in my case, um, I'm, de I'm developing like very quickly a, a, a kind of backstory scenario for working with these treasured two young people who seem ready to give so much and who seem also kind of raised by TV. They do live in a single parent home. Their mother was not part of their lives. So, and their father was uh, uh, eccentric, to put it mildly. An, an old hippie, motorcycle gang guy, <laughs> good friends of like, the Jefferson Airplane, Janice Joplin named Peggy Janice after Janice Joplin. So we had this uh, very California <laughs> uh, history. Um, part of the reason the whole thing happened, in fact, I think, that we could proceed and for so long because he was really a character. <laughs> and he, yeah, they all just loved the idea that we were making a movie. Leslie, can we make the movie today? That's so great. Wow. You were so smart to pick that up and, and go with it. I mean, really. Yeah. But it's also like early reality TV. Yeah. You know, these right. kids who know already what it means to perform for the camera. Right. 
Yes. And they want, they've, they're picturing themselves <coughs> as being on TV the minute your camera is present. That's right. Yeah. So um, as my partner who uh, finally made note of what it was, I still didn't tell you what I told the kids to do. All right, I'll, I might tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but it was my partner, Thomas Sumer, who pointed out to me finally, we're a few years in to this, he said, what they're doing is they're doing what they think is acting. So, <laughs> and that is very much an evidence here. They know the camera's on. I'd start the camera, 16 millimeter camera, with an 11 minute reel in it, and I'd, I learned fast, I can't be near the camera because they'll keep looking at the camera, and I didn't want that. And he just couldn't help it. So I'd turn it on and sneak into the room, and in this, that scene, I'm under the table. <laughs> and I could talk to them and cut my voice out. So that's, I'm now telling you what happened. <laughs> they were improvising, and I was improvising, and I, if I wanted them to do something like have a phone call, they didn't have a phone at home. They were in, infatuated with a phone. I knew they'd do something with it. I didn't expect that much. <laughs> but this preciousness of their behavior, their, you know, their commitment as young, kind of precocious kids was, it's play, but it's serious because we're making a movie. We are actors and the camera's running. <laughs> We're writing as we go. I mean, they weren't thinking of it as writing, <laughs> but they were performing. They were, and then well, I also learned looks like them. A fort. What? It looks like a fort that you would make, you know, in a room. There's a kind of mise en scène right. that you set up that so you're, it's contained, and you can you can be under the table, and they'll carry on with their business, whatever it is, and it's. Just yeah. so brilliant. I Actually, mean, it just, it just really was amazing. It, it was my whole life for a very long time. And I never had kids. So and I I will also say, going back to some comments that you made around about concerning language, um, that to uh, as you see the longer project, you'll see um, I mean part of play is also learning to speak, right? And and baby talk or post baby talk which I know is something Natalie's enjoying at the moment with a child, <laughs> myself. Um, I love witnessing that, the uh, becoming the social creature, which is what I thought was happening with these kids, also the creature that speaks and uh, in, in whatever language they're born into or multiple languages and how that will shape their world um, and how they, especially the little boy, often will get it wrong, as you'll see. Um, he's so enthusiastic about talking. It just doesn't matter that he's singing about lovers and he doesn't know where lovers are, but it's like, lovers! <laughs> and I'm just like, yes, what are lovers? I don't know. Uh, so it was, I thought I was going to make a feature, thank film, in about a year or two. And uh, I moved to, back to the East Coast. This was in San Francisco, where I was also teaching. I was hired at Brown University to teach film. So I, I moved back to the East Coast. And uh, OK, I just forgot what I was. I'm sorry. Maybe you're going to start feature. Out getting to a feature, but yeah. then oh, realized well, you okay, needed so an I have, format. Here I am <laughs> teaching narrative. At, at Brown. Now, I don't want to know anything about narrative. <laughs> I, don't, I wasn't of the school that I think actually most people are. Know your skill, like learn how to tell the story, then mess the story up. No way. You know <laughs> too much <laughs> then. Like, mess it up by shooting yourself in the head or what? Um, so I had this sense, but it really was being an artist and needing to experiment and find, have a feeling of discovery. So I had to discover narrative as if I was in early, like shooting Inventor. film in 1900. <laughs> or, or like, okay, Griffith notices, ah, 
<laughs> you can have like a closer in shot. And that's like that. <laughs> or how to work with performers. Um, in France, around the same time Griffith is uh, starting to actually write things down and have scripts, which by the way, helps you sell something. It's not just like, oh, it would be good to figure out some of the stuff people are gonna do, let's write it down. It's also, I got this thing, you have money. But at around the same time, um, in, in France, the director Fouillard um, is equal to Griffith in importance at the time. He only works with improvisation. He has a, a famous series of shorts uh, uh, organized around a vampire family and cops and stuff, bad stuff that's happening all the time. But any one day on the set, whoever showed up just got stuck into whatever role, like the vampires are good, they're bad. Some of the vampires are cops, now they're not. Essentially like that. <laughs> and uh, that's a less containable and marketable, in my, inter my interpretation of that history, uh, approach to storytelling mm -hmm. um, than what Griffith developed. Well, and Peggy and Fred has been a work that, you know, speaking of the market, I think it really thwarts marketability yes. by its very nature, you know, and it's, it, sure does. it has been seen, various edits of it have been seen for decades in film festivals right. and in some uh, <laughs> exhibition installations. But, you know, when you go back to try to trace the history of it, it's really complicated to piece together also because it was unfinished. So different critics writing about it at different periods in time have a different story in their hands. Yes. And you don't even get to the AI bit until the very end. Yeah. Right. So even though that was your conceit from the beginning and the backstory that was inspiring it, you didn't let on about that, yep. which is interesting from a historical an art historical perspective but also is like a complete mess for art historians at this point <laughs> to try to put back together. Um, but to your credit, like makes the work much more interesting. Yep. Yeah, it had to be that way. I had at least three final edits, final film of Peggy and Fred at, in Hell at the Rotterdam Film Festival, for instance, three times, final. <laughs> right, and I think there are a few institutional copies that are out there. Oh, absolutely. That are, you know, they were purchased, acquired right. as and final Malma versions. And Pompidou, and <laughs> which are ancient, ancient. Yeah. And they're no longer the current final version. Oh, no, we're close. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of them, the Pompidou's on VHS. So <laughs> that's yeah. how bad it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I want to just did. be conscious of our time. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I Peggy and Fred is such a rich territory, but do we want to jump to a more recent work? Yeah, I guess you can now kind of oh, guess yeah. what we told the kids and then just go see the piece. And I will say something very interesting that Natalie did here that has not been done before was that I, the work was released into the world as a series of uh, mostly freestanding episodes. And I did have the idea of it being possibly modular and that some uh, the curator might want to choose different bits, and I don't think it ever really happened that way. But I did at first think that was possible. Um, what exists now, I have not touched since 2015, <laughs> when I made a, I completed this, this work with that episode that closes it, where the AI is revealed, and then the AI fizzles out, and the AI might be speaking from 2,000 years from now. Uh, the AI needed uh, energy to keep running, and that's what ended. I don't, I, that's not in the film, but I, that's my expectation of the, the final dissolution of this presence. Um, and along the way, the AI, I do want to just take a minute and say this, that the AI um, uh, was <coughs> actually based on research, uh, <laughs> loosely, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> loosely based on research being done here uh, around affect in, in AI. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a woman here who was working with a, a Ray Harryhausen, mm -hmm. who was a, a model maker um, for things like, like Star Wars. And she worked with him, for instance, on developing uh, figures 
that were sympathetic and, and would tend to get more interaction going. I think at the media lab, there would be somebody, some little robot-y thing. Uh, uh, the most famous one was Kismet uh, that looks like a baby that's uh, like cute. Just to get the data, like, hey, did you see that Red Sox game the other day? That kind of thing, just walking by. Well, the media, Kismet. the MIT Museum has all the robots. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. Well, that's it what opens I, again. <laughs> and so actually, that was the starting off the point for um, thinking about what's the attitude, or what's my backstory attitude uh, that allows me to work with these kids. Um, yeah, and then AI. It shows up at the end. And I do want to say, in terms of it being unsaleable, I just do want to say publicly, there was a point where I put, <laughs> I put like a sliding title like at the beginning of Star Wars, like, uh, whatever that first Star Wars says, and this <laughs> happened, and this happened, and this is big. I did it with the AI and took it to film forum to try to show it. It was just so awful, and it killed the whole film. Ah. Which leads me <laughs> to another point. It does have to do with some of the issues I think you wanted to focus on, including like process and understanding. All right. Yeah. So, um, so um, what was extremely important in this work and in most of my work is I don't want you to be able to see it and say, that's this. That's what it's telling me. That's what it's about. Do not do that. It is hard. It's almost <laughs> early on I said I wrote this short essay on how I can make Peggy and Friend hell. This is very early on because I'm not insane. Now I'm probably a little closer. I'm not insane. I just <laughs> have developed a, developed a lot of like loose paths I trust in my mind. Like I, I do say you are what you do as well as you are what you eat. You are what you do. And the longer you do it, the more that's how your mind works. So um, I have a lot of comfort and a need to not anchor meaning in only one place. I'm not making a product. I, I, don't, I am not trying to convince you of something. I am trying to create a kind of presence and experience that is different somehow. Well, every time you see it, it's a different experience, even yes. if you've mm -hmm. seen it a bunch, like I have. Yeah. You know, I, th I think that, that that really comes through in Peggy and Fred in Hell. Yeah, or even a recent work like Ground, which right, I don't Ground know if is what you will want to um, focus on in our yeah. remaining time, but it makes yeah. me think of it because at one point you sa said to me, and it really stuck with me, like, it's not about anything. It's not <laughs> about anything. You're not supposed to get anything. You're supposed to not get it. You're supposed to just let it wash over you and yeah. experience it, and that has a lot to do with the kind of vocal event and the way that you've made it, but I'll let you maybe speak Thank to you. that. So we could um, actually skip over the uh, cut from Liquid to Snake, which is actually harder for me to talk about at all. Anyway, yeah. Still. Let's let, uh, then let's cut to ground and we'll leave room for questions. Okay. Yeah. So maybe a little of hemlock, which is still yes. in 30 seconds. Yes. All right. So ground. So in the last uh, three years, I uh, had this enormous privilege of um, being invited to uh, to three different major science institution artist residencies. Two times to CERN in Geneva and once to Caltech. Um, so in the last three years. And I, uh, a lot of the, my approach to shooting and Peggy and Fred and other things is that I am always filming uh, and creating, uh, it, it can be quite focused as it was with the kids or it can be more general creating my own archive. I call it an archive. It's one reason people think I work a lot with found footage. In fact, I mostly shoot everything. I shoot most of it. There's more found material in sound, actually. But uh, I do shoot most everything. Um, uh, but I call it an archive, so it's my own. And I, I, it may be years before I dig into that archive. Um, so for the last three years, I've been developing an archive <laughs> filming at the, these uh, two different institutions. Um, and 
uh, well, it's a little hard for me to talk about, but so I am in the setting of, uh, the focus has been on physics. And so I am in the setting of, of the cutting edge of it, uh, not the theory, but the experimental side, experiment, uh, the, the proof side, the more physical proof side of, of uh, physics, so particle physics in particular, and also research on antimatter, uh, which it would be kind of related. And, and they are both things I, lo I know a little enough about myself to engage with somebody. Um, CERN is fascinating, and not because the detectors are so fabulous and big. Like, you can film those big five-story, big, like, gigantic things, and a lot of artists want to go there, and they go there, and they do that, and then it's like, so what? Um, that's not it. So I could go and, and be with a woman who's one of the main figures uh, involved in the building of the Alice uh, detector, which is the more recent one, and then what do I ask? What do I say? What do I do? I just said, what part of this is yours? What did you do? And then that is a very different, so I've generally, I'm filming people and I'm trying to find a question that isn't the kind that would usually be asked of them necessarily. So, um, so I uh, had many extraordinary encounters and, and the piece Ground, which was the first piece to come out of this bank of material. Um, uh, I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> oh my God, I keep, he's working with kaons and it's uh, a, a dipolar disparity or if anyone can correct me in the audience, I should have written that down because I always have this little anxiety and forget it. <laughs> it's not quarks, it's kaons. Um, Higgs well, the Higgs, Higgs, Higgs boson, but that's the big famous one. Right. Um, but yeah, but there are many small research projects going on and this is one of them. And I had wanted to meet somebody actually who was working in any matter, uh, who uh, knew, <coughs> expect a family, a family friend who worked in Los Alamos with my dad, was Val, Val Fitch who ended up, so he went on to get a Nobel in, 60, in 80 for 1964 particle, phys a particle accelerator experiment where they, determ they were able to demonstrate um, the, 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 the a, a kind of aspect of why matter would why matter would be more present than antimatter, because at the moment of the origin <laughs> or the Big Bang, in, theoretically they would be equal. So what is what ha, what was the situation that allowed a matter? Uh, antimatter is not like no matter; it's just like a different charge. It's the opposite charge, basically, on, on the most simple level. So. Uh, the word antimatter is sounds more peculiar and sexy than the thing is, though it's certainly sexy. <laughs> um, uh, it's just not non. So uh, anyway, I had wanted to find somebody who was willing to talk about the work of Val Fitch, and it, well, I'm it's just interesting say that because yeah. we're at MIT. But Val yeah, Fitch, yes. well, I was going to say, you know, you you've told me that so many physicists because of the nature of their work. Yeah. They're not necessarily historians of their field. Right, They're exactly. always le leading on the next edge. Right. Um, mm. And it, you know, con you know, against other fields like maybe architecture, where it's imp really important to know your predecessors, physicists may not necessarily. When they know, they just don't want to talk about it because what they're doing is so much more interesting. Yeah. That's what it came down to. <laughs> we should jump and get the, the clip of him going. Okay, let's look at the clip. Yes, this so number uh, <laughs> five. Uh, five. The work called ground. We're skipping four. So number five, ground. The thing is that the Cherenkov angle 
it's proportional to the velocity of the particle. So along the trajectory, these photons are generated. If you put a spherical mirror, you're reflecting them, all of them, at the focal plane of the mirror. And so, although they all came from different points, they all converge at the same place, and you make a ring. Yeah, 40% of the, of, the, of the glass is actually lead. And I was teasing people, saying, don't worry, if it doesn't work, we will use it as a telescope. <laughs> it has a beautiful mosaic of mirrors. Mm. And then another thing is, in particle physics, is we don't, right? And they are inside the tank, in vacuum, because we cannot tolerate any interaction of particles with matter. That's what's so special about this experiment. The detectors have to be in vacuum, even large detectors like this. They are housed in the white cylinders. You see them along the blue tank. Those are Bohemian crystals of beautiful Bohemian crystals were the previous experiment. Let's go up. Okay, before you turn the lights on, could you just now run number six, which is called Hemlock? And it's very short, it's the newest piece, but I can speak a little about both of them. And I guess we might have to do questions out in the hall. Uh, <laughs> but yes, if you could please run that. It's silent. Okay, thank you. Uh, I won't, I guess I, I can't say too much more. I'll say that I am in love with the space of science, uh, not science itself, but the setting, uh, the possibilities um, of uh, no, acquisition of knowledge, the, the unknown, the risk factors, uh, that one lives with, uh, like working on the Higgs boson, thinking this is the case for 35 years and being able to say, I might be wrong, that's fine. Uh, uh, and the other thing that I was very attached to, and the reason I wanted you to see this, this last bit, which is, is part of a new series, which will have the collective title Hemlock, I won't explain why yet, uh, this is Hemlock Handmade, uh, because at these institutions, um, let's say the question of theory and practice are applied, let's say theory abstractions and applied um, or proofs. Uh, I'm on the proof side, I'm on the material side and a joy in visiting these <laughs> facilities and seeing that this is this guy, you, you walk in to CERN and it's like, okay, you're using aluminum foil and rope to hold this thing together and the <laughs> stuffing's coming out. And, and I say, whoa, this looks like there were no engineers or architects involved. I walk in the first day to the antimatter factory at CERN and the fellow I'm meeting says, absolutely, in fact, if you don't know how to do basic wiring and soldering, you have no business here. The only thing in this whole building that an engineer worked on was that. 
We don't have time to figure it out for the engineers. We have to do it. And that includes at Caltech learning, I don't remember what they call Home Depot, but having, you have to figure out how to make the thing that's gonna do the test and then you do the test and then that's not quite right or you can make it better. And you do that and that includes the people who are uh, doing the math sometimes. So this fellow is uh, a physicist and he's, he learned how to weed uh, watching YouTube videos <laughs> of <laughs> rug making because he had a better idea about the sock uh, that is going to be inserted into a cryosphere that has, uh, will be part of a big antimatter experiment. So that's where my life is now and will be probably for a number of years. Uh, it's my new peg in Fred. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, we're honored to get to have that in this show. And it's very different to see it on this screen because yeah. in the exhibition space, it really occupies the space of a painting. Yes. And, yeah. and it's I do, silent. I make, thought of it. It silence too. makes it feel very material in that way. Um, and that also feels like a very interesting new direction in your work. Yeah. 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 It's a little, there's a little of going back to painting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And really. then there's more of an object mm -hmm. yeah. to it. And uh, I mean, content wise, this will be playing around with flow studies and, and history. It's yeah. archi it is archival mm -hmm. material. What you're seeing on the top is a really complicated. Mm -hmm. mashup of a storm I shot <laughs> recently in Michigan mm -hmm. on the Lake Huron and uh, and yes and so uh, should we open it up I to just want to see I, I'll keep talking if no one has a comment or a question mm -hmm. but that would be really nice anything yes reminds me of all the forces that we don't know anything about that are operating as I speak and um, how, how technology can eventually uh, reveal those forces and, and just how artists um, insert themselves into those situations and somehow um, reveal even more. So right. I, I love the madness of it, the, the unexpected views, and, and um, sometimes it makes me feel like I, I can't, I wonder if I could put my foot on the ground and actually touch something solid, you know, because there are so many things when you start thinking about physics and forces, atomic energy, and, and what else is coming down the pike. It's kind of blows your mind. So thank you. Just keep doing it, please. <laughs> I, 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 thank this you. is the first time I'm, I'm learning about your work, so I'm, I'm going to check it out with Thank pleasure. you very much. Yeah. And I would like to say something about what I learned about science and art going to these places. Because I think a lot of, um, actually, it depends on who you're meeting, but and Judith is working here and engaging with some of the scientists as well. Trying. Uh, trying? <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's always only trying. And it's both directions. But there's yes. a, it seems like there's a kind of fascination, there can be a kind of fascination on the part of the scientist, researcher, and the artist, and the feeling that maybe we have something in common. And so I felt that that was the case. And, and many people I worked with uh, and recorded um, would say that, that we have something in common. And so what is it that we have in common? Because by the end of these three trips, I thought, I know what we don't have in common, and it's big. So the work being done in research has a goal. And what at least I'm doing, or what can be happening in the arts, is not the, uh, it's not goal-oriented. I mean, for me, it's spread. It's always spread. But what is of interest and common and why could we ever feel this way is, well, maybe one is passion, actually. There can be tr true passion um, and process and risk and experimentation. These are things that are shared, but one is 
there's a focus and a goal for a kind of knowledge. And I don't know that what I would, I wouldn't say anything I do is about knowledge. It can be about a knowing, a sense of knowing that is not specifically in the bigger term, it's, a knowl it's not knowledge. Right. It's more I think witnessing. You're not in the business of the production of knowledge. No. You know, you, de you inevitably deal with knowledge, but right. you're in the business of uh, distorting, of undermining, of, you know, Insight, warping it through different I think, is, kinds is of what filters. you do. It's what? Insight. You, you provide an insight in the imagery that makes the viewer or yeah. causes the viewer yeah. to try to decode what you're saying. Yeah. And it's interesting enough that you find your your path through it right. over and over and over again. It's it's kind of remarkable. What I feel I would I am as a being is in, in terms of making is a cipher. So um, I don't have a goal for my viewer or my audience for uh, I, I don't have a specific goal. I just am able, I've learned and I'm able to uh, have things pass through and be processed and made manifest in some way. And as long as I can keep doing that, I will want to be alive. <laughs> and I just, I don't see any end for us, except if you're younger and you're stuck online or in the, like, please don't just only live online and be sure we're not we're not ready yet. We're in a nightmare right now, in my opinion. <laughs> that uh, and actually, those of us who are older are more aware of <laughs> the nightmare. And it's not just nostalgia. It's like we're really worried. <laughs> like because uh, so, there is too much, and we do not only want to be making people rich. I'll just keep it at that. Those few people who want going rockets. Uh, we don't, like, that's not why we're all here, please. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, your work shows us, you know, first of all, how you process the world around you. And I think as a cipher offers ways of processing for people too. And, you know, I really appreciate that because as many people, including one of our books contributors, have observed so much of your work deals with catastrophe, mm -hmm. with disaster, uh, and the, the catastrophe and disaster that, that technology can wreak, but also the climate and our impact on it. Uh, but your work doesn't stop there either. It's not just about that. And so I think that's important to, to bear in mind and, um, and also just appreciate the way that you bring your observations, your way of looking to these things um, that aren't, you know, just a full stop, but but really keep it kind of open-ended. I'm glad you mentioned that because I'll just, I can end by saying um, Natalie is editing a book about uh, the uh, exhibition and my, well, about my work. And uh, there's, a, for me, I believe a truly exceptional essay and original essay uh, by Dan Kidner, uh, based in London, who does focus on this notion of catastrophe, but it's also catastrophe in the sense of a kind of collapse. And he he does write about, well, well it's, it is a kind of apocalyptic world uh, that he references, but he helped me understand something that is I recognize is now the case, which is I am not afraid of being afraid. And uh, I'm anxious as a person in my regular life. I'm like, I'm like stricken, but but in work, and in the possibilities of finding and sharing, I'm I'm not afraid. And so he's also talking about that, and he's talking about catastrophe as a place of lack of meaning. So, but it, that it's not meaningless, but it is an occupation of a kind of space that is not usually even allowed. <laughs> Uh, but it's there in this work. So mm -hmm. it, it's, I, I think, a really important essay. Mm -hmm. um, he thought, yeah, anyway, Dan Kidner yeah. coming up. Yeah, yeah. and there's something book. radical about occupying that space without proposing a way to, a way out or a resolution or a kind of happy ending. Well, um, just to be able to see to being, a space, yeah. that's a step. Mm -hmm. And somebody else can also work on 
how do, what do we do now? Well, it's also very liminal, yeah. that space that you make, yeah. which really allows for lots of different experiences in the space yes. once you're in the space. Absolutely. Like in ground, like you don't really know where you are, but then there's that kind of figurative character that's coming in and out of focus and taking you back in the space. And you can only attach to that <clears throat> character because there's a voice mm -hmm. and there's a lot of texture and, and, and he's speaking of specific things, but the attachment, the anchor is the voice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, I think we should close and um, thank you again, everyone for joining us. We can continue with conversation out in the hall. Thank you, Leslie, for bringing your work to MIT and, and for sharing with us today so many insights. And, and thank yeah. you both very much for sharing this time with me. It's great and to see the show. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.